If your dream is to be a hitman for a Mexican drug cartel, you've got to start young. Teens are the best. They enjoyed the rush. They enjoyed getting paid to kill people. Yeah. Best of all are Chicano kids. They can blend in on both sides of the board. You had American youth dress like Americans, speak like Americans, able to travel like Americans. <laughs> there was a lot of money involved. Cars, girls, anything you need. To a teenage hitman, life is a video game. His victims just loses. Too bad for that. My name is Steve Sharippa. I grew up in a pretty rough neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York. I've seen good people turn bad and bad people turn worse. Some took contracts to carry out a hit. Some were victims of a hit. It's a hit, man. Life and death are just part of the business. It's nothing personal. It's December 2005. It's a sunny afternoon in Laredo, Texas. Moises Garcia, his wife and son, are out for lunch at a local Tex-Mex chain. Moises Garcia was a young person, I think mid-20s. Mid Had a family. I think he was expecting a child. What Moises doesn't know is that his plate of rice and beans will be his last meal. Those three kids circling the block are assassins. They're pros. They've been looking for him. That kid with a pistol is Rosalio Retta, an American teen from Texas. Rosalio Retta is very short, stocky, and has a very peculiar look to him. Um, his nickname was Bart, because they, they said he looked like Bart Simpson. The fact that Rosalio Retta looks like Bart Simpson isn't that unusual for an American teen. But he does have things that make him special. Oh, he's got a lot of drive. He's got a job. He's got a talent, and he works very hard. Thing is, his talent is for murder. He's a hitman, and he started when he was 13. The years go by, and so do the killings. By the time he's 16, Retta's got nearly 30 notches in his belt. Blowing away Moises Garcia will add one, but it's just another afternoon's work. He liked killing people. If they use that natural bone killer, that's what he is. He would kill somebody and sleep like a baby. So that was his words. Now, this guy just doesn't possess the God gene that everybody talks about. He, he just, he has no remorse whatsoever. To me, it's a job, just like you got a job. I had a job, I just, I know it's not right taking people's lives, but um, that's one of the things I'm good at. So, Rosalio Retta is a cold-blooded teenage assassin. This is the first time he's allowed TV cameras to show his face, now decorated with prison tattoos. If you tell me who to kill, you're gonna pay me. I just go on and do it. I just go on and do it. I mean, how did that happen? This is a kid from a normal home. What turns him into a killer without a conscience? Retta himself has no idea. There's nothing to indicate that Reto was going to turn out to be what he turned out to be. Other than being considered a little funny looking, there is nothing troubled about Reto's childhood. He grew up in Laredo, Texas, a mid-sized city on the Rio Grande, just across the border from Mexico. The Retos aren't rich, but none of the neighbors are either. My mom's, uh, she's a hairstylist. And uh, my dad, uh, that, uh, construction company thingy. Parents always provided us with everything. Happy family. They never knew what I was doing. They just knew I was doing something bad. And uh, always asked me to stay away from everything I was doing, but it was too late for that. Young Rosalio wants to be a commando when he grows up. Special forces. The real tough guys. When I was small, I wanted to be a, a Navy SEAL for the military, but uh, 
started getting in trouble and you can be part of that with a criminal record. A rap sheet might put off Navy recruiters, but there are outfits that consider having one a feather in your cap. In Laredo, those guys are easy to find. Laredo is the largest border crossing for goods coming into the U.S. from Mexico. Most of it's legit. You know, raspberries, tequila, DVD players. But hidden in those shipments are billions of dollars worth of drugs. Cocaine, heroin, marijuana. When people talk about Mexican drugs flooding into the U.S., they're talking about a river that starts in Laredo and flows up into State 35, the Nile of cocaine. Most of the $50 billion a year worth of narcotics that ends up polluting American bloodstreams crosses the Rio Grande at Laredo. And the I-35 corridor begins in Laredo and extends up north to San Antonio, and it hits Austin, and it goes up to Dallas, and it can hit a lot of markets in the United States. So it's obviously very lucrative. Whoever controls the geography, the gateways into the United States, is going to control the drug distribution network. So, drug smugglers are vying to control the turf Rosalio read the nose like the back of his hand. That's frightening to some. To others, it's an opportunity. You're atypical, you know, poor kid from the border that really didn't have a future, that really didn't have a lot of options. So why not turn to organized crime? Poor kids dream of getting rich one day. In Laredo, the only rich people most poor kids see are drug dealers. So that's the dream. And the richest guys, they're the ones who work for the big cartels. Even though Ritter's parents both worked, they put no silver spoons in their son's mouth. It's not unusual or hard to believe that a lot of these kids latch on to these ideas of this glamour, um, this sort of uh, indestructible lifestyle. They are offered cash, cars, as many girlfriends as they want, power, prestige, the ability to take a life and not blink an eye. I liked it. I grew up liking that kind of lifestyle. Just want to be a part of it, so. Bretta isn't the only kid who wants out of Laredo's dusty streets. His best friend, Gabriel Cardona. We just were best friends since we were kids. We still go to school together and everything. Gabriela Maldonado is Gabriel Cardona's mother. She can't stop her boy from getting lured into the drug life, and the reason is plain to see. The money. They don't want to be poor. They don't want to work. They want to have money just like that, easy. Cardona dreams of mainstream success, but his ambitions don't survive the temptation of easy money. He used to say he was going to be a lawyer, be a police, and... But before he was 15, and after that, I think the, the, his friends shank him. To her, Rosalio Retta, even though he is younger, is the driving force, just a bad seat. I didn't like him. You can tell him if, uh, if he's a good boy or he's not, just by looking at him. Good or bad, if they had money in their pockets, kids in Laredo head across the Rio Grande to get their kicks. Nuevo Laredo is their town's far spicier Mexican sister. They go out there and hang out in nightclubs on the Mexican uh, side, and they start seeing their old friends, you know, hanging around with good-looking women. They're driving around expensive vehicles, a lot of money, and they don't have a job. The Eclipse is the place that draws them. If you want to be noticed in Nuevo Laredo, the Eclipse is your stage. I used to go there a lot. Everybody used to go to that club. The two pals from across the border get noticed, all right. Scouted is more like it. Retta is just 13. Cardona, he's 16. But they have a natural ability. That much is clear. At that point in time, there was certain members of that cartel that, I guess, befriended him. The guy who adds them to his entourage is a big fish. Cartel boss Miguel Trevino. Miguel Trevino Morales is greatly feared. One of the bad guys, you know, one of the people that you do not want to mess with. 
Trevino is a man that is deemed to be by the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration uh, one of the primary cartel warlords that rules an empire. This is something you got to know about Mexico. Drug bosses are rock stars. Kicking with Miguel Trevino makes you a player. I was real close to one of the big guys in Mexico. Kept on seeing me around a lot. Like what I do, the way I do it. So I started coming up little by little. What Retta does is her people. The way he does it is without remorse or hesitation. Trevino likes that. And make no mistake, Miguel Trevino is a truly bad guy. He has been known to participate and watch beheadings. Uh, this is an individual that is not afraid of picking up an entire family and eliminating them. Trevino commands a whole posse of killers, the Zetas. The Zetas are former Mexican army commandos who figured out that the bad guys pay way better. So they become enforcers for the Gulf drug cartel. When you look at the importance of the Gulf cartel uh, in, in connection to uh, the actual drug trade, uh, this is one of the major cartels operating in Mexico. The Gulf cartel is run by guys like Juan Garcia Abrego and Carlos de la Cruz Reina. The Gulf guys are big time mostly because they control the Laredo Crossing and thus the I-35 corridor. They keep control by killing anyone who gets in their way. Causing that carnage is what the Zetas do for a living. You know, a lot of kids are like, I want to be a, I want to be a doctor, I want to be an attorney. Everybody down there, they want to be Zetas. I want to be a Zeta, I want to be a Zeta. Ferretta and Cardona, their childhood wishes come true. Trevino decides the boys have the right stuff to kill for the Zetas. But why do the cartels recruit teenagers? Why send boys to do hitmen's work? Cartel bosses like Mikhail Trevino have given that a lot of thought. It's a question of psychology. Teens don't think about consequences. Their moral sense is less developed. But these teens' biggest appeal to Trevino is a special something other Zeta wannabes don't have and can't get, American passports. They can travel, they can mix, intermingle with other people here. They can themselves recruit other, other friends of them. Combine those Yankee passports with a taste for homicide and you're a top draft pick for a Zeta dead squad. Retta and Cardona think murder is so much fun they do it for kicks. Cardona's first killing is a drunk he shoots in the face just to see what it was like. Trevino tests Retta, too. I just wanted to see where you were at. You were able to kill someone. A lot of people say, say a lot of things, yeah, I'll do this, I'll do that, but when it really comes down to it, I'm not going to do anything. In Mexico's narco culture, killing someone isn't just business. It's how you send a message to your victim's compadres. This is what'll happen to you if you don't get out of our way. Victims aren't just killed, they're tortured and butchered. Heads are sawn off, bodies dismembered, toyed with, and then burned in oil drums. They call that a guiso or a stew. So what's the test Trevino gives Retta? They grab a guy they're having problems with, and tie him up. Then Trevino hands his jewel pistol to a 13-year-old Rosalia. So, just killed him. Stepped into a different world. It all changed. But at first, yeah, I started liking it. He executed him to prove his loyalty, to prove that he had enough to commit a murder. I knew what I was getting myself into. I wasn't a kid anymore at that time. It turned out that uh, this 13-year-old was not your average kid. Rosalio Retta has the raw material to be a cartel killer. But at 13, he doesn't have the skills to fit in with the feared Zetas. Mikhail Trevino plans to develop his protege. Retta is going to be a star. He'll be the last one a lot of people see. In the fall of 2005, 
American teenage assassins Rosalia Oretta and Gabriel Cardona are working for a drug cartel. Moises Garcia is in the business himself. That's about to put him in harm's way. Some will see that as poetic justice, the law of the drug jungle. But Moises is not all bad. Oh my God, you win. Ow. He was married. He was a father, uh, a son. Moises might be a good family man, but he does earn his living selling narcotics. He supplies a Laredo neighborhood. Moise Garcia was a member of the Mexican Mafia. The Mexican Mafia is a prison gang that was originated in California. It's real strong in the Texas area, real strong in, in, in our city. Moises Garcia, by the way, is no saint. He shot a guy in the head when he was 18, a prison friend of his. They met doing time on drug charges. Anyway, what I'm getting at is Moises, Reda, and Cardona are from the same world. I mean, they're all criminals. But maybe Moises is a little behind the times. 25 is old for a drug dealer. In that world, life is for the young. So Moises Garcia is a small-time criminal. But what makes him important? Well, he's graduating to the big leagues. He's been doing some marketing for the Sinaloa cartel. He was contracted uh, to perform certain services for a rival uh, cartel. It's my understanding that that was the rationale and the reasoning behind him being uh, set up as a target. And being someone the Zetas have a beef with is not what you call survivable. Getting killed, that's one of the main things. If you get on, step on someone's toes, you, you, you're gonna get killed. Garcia is about to become a fatality in an old-fashioned turf war. That I-35 drug corridor, just because the Gulf Cartel has a lock on Laredo doesn't mean the other guys won't try to muscle in. Chapo Guzman runs the biggest cartel in Mexico, the Sinaloans. They've got a near monopoly on supply, but they don't control any border crossings. They go to war to grab Laredo from the Gulf Cartel. When the Sinaloan cartel tries to move in on this area, you have a traditional power struggle that unfolds. There's a huge infighting and rivalries uh, uh, begin to exist. It was our territory right there, so they can't just come and try to take over like that. If you want somebody's criminal empire, you don't ask nicely. It's blood in the streets, and we're talking buckets. I started killing people, trying to get us out of the way. There's a bloodbath going on back then. I think Mother Riddle had over like 300, 400 murders in about a six month span, and it was out of control. There's more right there in uh, Nuevo Laredo, and there's more drugs, more money going on, so everybody wants, they're fighting for that spot. Miguel Trevino is the Gulf Cartel's general patent, and Laredo is his Battle of the Bulge. He needs firepower on his front lines. And those American teens, they are really valuable. They can wipe out the Sinaloan enemy on the Texas front. Trevino took a very personal interest in, in hand-selecting the individuals that were going to be used, spending a lot of time with them, grooming them along like any good special forces officer would with his close combat team. So when he's 14 or 15, Retta finds out he's won a Zeta scholarship to assassin school. If this is your dream, here's how you get the good news. They grab you off the street, stuff your head in a bag, and take you for a long ride. It's like winning hell's lottery. Every hundred people, they're only going to pick one. And I was one of them. Most of these kinds of training operations are taking place on very rural ranch properties that are owned by the cartels. It's like a special force training. For a lot of kids, summer camp is a rite of passage, a chance to learn new skills, make new friends, you know, come into your own. At Camp Zeta, Retta meets new people and picks up some awesome new skills. Firearms, knife fighting, hand-to-hand -hand combat, beheadings. He's not so wild about stewing people, though. Hates the smell. 
know how to use any type of military weapons, hand-to-hand -hand combat. The main thing is uh, show you how to kill. Like it does for a lot of kids, camp matures him. Comes in a punk and he leaves an assassin, an experienced assassin. Killing people, doing this, it's, like I say, it's a job. Retta takes to being a Sicario like a coyote to an overfed chihuahua. In no time, he's on the Zetas A team. The killers, they say, for really important jobs. There was only uh, like 150 in all Mexico of us. So we just go for like big people, not, not, a, not a nobody. When he first began, I mean, he was a tremendous asset because of the skills that he brought into the organization. He gets busy real fast. He and his fellow campers join the war and show those Sinaloan drug runners no mercy. That's what you do every day over there in Mexico. Every day, on a daily basis, you probably kill like five, six people a day. But Miguel Trevino doesn't need the American teens in Mexico. The battle's over Laredo, remember? And it's on the U.S. side that Retta, Cardona, and their American passports can really have an impact. Miguel Trevino Morales would send these uh, cells that were already in Laredo, U.S. citizens, to, um, to take out rivals from the Sinaloa cartel. So in 2005, the big boss Trevino sets up a couple of teams of hitmen in Laredo. He makes Gabriel Cardona a manager and gives him two of his homeboys, Retta and Jesse Gonzalez, as triggermen. The three Sicarios, that's what cartel assassins are called, live together in a nice house, rent-free, kind of like the real world or the monkeys or something like that. Anything they earn, and they make a lot, is pocket money. And money for these guys is a big deal. Their handlers would rent safe houses for them, um, and they would stay there, and that's where they were, the, the communication would take place. There were vehicles that were purchased by the cartel for them to, to utilize in the murders. They were part of weapons, food, and cell phones. Their weekly salary was $500 per person, and that was just to be on standby. And all this would be obviously be paid for by their handlers, by Miguel Trevino Morales. We had a normal life. We're doing everything a normal person does. We just, once you get caught, you got to go and take that person out. We're not filling Sinaloans with lead. The teams are living in a teen paradise. Mattresses on the floor, video games, booze. There was a lot of money involved. Cars, girls, anything you need. But uh, once you kill somebody, you assassinate somebody, you go from, if it's nobody, 10, 20, thousand dollars but uh i wasn't doing all that if you were a nobody I, I don't want to know anything about it the people we were taking out it was like from 75 125 200 250 all, all the way up to 400,000. with that kind of income and no expenses you can buy anything a teenager might want yeah Greta, he likes nice cars so what if he's not old enough to drive? The first Mercedes he got, he wanted a raffle. The cartel was hosting some of their, I guess you'd call it a company picnic, for lack of a better term. They handed out door prizes, and he walked away with the, you know, $75,000 Mercedes. Because Guy was only 14 at the time. You do good work. They give you good things. Rosalia Retta has come a long way. He's got a Mercedes and an unlimited supply of games and girls. And if that isn't good enough, he gets to kill people too. For Retta, life is good, and dealing debt just makes it better. These teenagers were thrill seekers. They enjoyed the rush. Um, they enjoyed getting paid to kill people. Uh, they really actually liked doing it. Now, killing a guy, if you're a professional, is not a spur-in-the-moment thing. Most murders are, which is why they get solved pretty quickly. Killing isn't hard. It's not getting caught that separates the pros from the merely homicidal. I mean, you got to have a plan. 
And when you figure into their plans, it's going to be a very bad day. American teenagers Rosalio Retta and Gabriel Cardona are working for the Zetas. They're helping fend off a rival drug cartel, which is trying to take control of the border crossing from Mexico to Laredo, Texas. Everybody wants, they're fighting for that spot. Try to come in, but uh, they didn't make it. But the war won't really be won until the U.S. side is cleared of Sinaloan allies. That's why Moises Garcia will end up dead. But there's more to this story than a war between two drug cartels. Laredo's got a man on the front lines of law enforcement. He's also named Garcia, Detective Robert Garcia, the Sherlock Holmes of the Tex-Mex border. We interviewed him in shadow for his own safety. There's always been violence on the, on the border, but the, the way that, that some of the murders were being committed started raising some flags as to new trends of uh, criminals coming in. Garcia's seen a corpse or two in his time. He's got a connoisseur's eye for professional murders. The way they were committed, I mean, it's, it's, it's not the usual type. This one, she started seeing more a gang-style type of thing, you know, uh, using more high-power weapons, you know, AK-47s, and um, it looks like they were more planned. Garcia knows the cartel's appetite for violence is more than his small department can handle. He can see the storm clouds across the river. From day one, we knew that whatever happened across is going to trickle into our side. It's going to have an effect. So we were always working together and trying to get ahead of it. We're not going to bury our heads in the, in the sand and, and say there's no spillover, there's no violence, or it doesn't affect us. Garcia fears that if Mexico's drug war spills across his border, Laredo, Texas could become as lawless as Nuevo Laredo, Mexico. Garcia wants to get nine different government agencies, state and federal, to cooperate to share information and resources. Do you have any idea how hard that is? Well, he does it. They all sign on to stop the drug cartel's Texas killing spree. With that kind of investigative firepower, Bart stays as a Sicario or numbered. The detective mobilizes every force he can. We started forming our own intelligence units, our own uh, type of uh, aggressive patrol, picking up uh, local gang members, and started interviewing them. At first, he doesn't get much. The break comes when Detective Garcia is assigned to investigate the murder of a guy named Noe Flores. Uh, Noe Flores, that was mistaken identity. They were targeting his brother, which was Mike Lopez, but they killed uh, Noe Flores by mistake. Mike Lopez uh, befriended and started dating Miguel Trevino Morales, his ex-girlfriend, so that's why he wanted to do away with this guy. So the boss Trevino has his boys drive up to Lopez's house. He's there. Bang, bang, bang. Easy peasy. He was shot at least, I want to say, a good six or eight times. You know, they leave thinking that they got Mike Lopez. Only one little problem. They pumped the wrong guy full of lead. Mr. Flores, unfortunately, was at the wrong place at the wrong time. Swapping cars a few blocks from a hit is one of those things they test you on at Camp Zeta. It's textbook getaway technique. But if you go to an academy for assassins, they make sure to remind you not to leave evidence behind. If killing the wrong guy was the only screw-up, it would have been no big deal. But the teen Sicarios, they're having an off day. Anybody who's got teenagers knows it's way easier to persuade them to murder total strangers than it is to get them to clean up after themselves. There's a pack of cigarettes that are left behind with a, with a print that comes back to Retta. The breakthrough that actually helps us break not only this case, but subsequently all the cases, was a piece of paper that was left behind. Now, that little receipt was for a pay-as-you-go cell phone top-up. Oops. So Garcia's got a set of prints and a cell phone receipt. The receipt leads Garcia to a tattoo parlor. He leaves his business card. The owner tips off Retta. A few days later, the detective's phone rings. Garcia. He doesn't recognize the voice. Yeah. 
He says, I have an understanding you're looking for me on BART. You better stop investigating the murders. Or, you know, we're gonna kill you and your family. You don't know who you're messing with. Just calm down. Tell him to stay away. Because I didn't want to do anything to him. I wasn't really worried about uh, the rest of the homicide detectives because they're all uh, naive and green. So he was the smartest one of the, the whole lot. So that's one we had to watch out for. So yeah, we knew where he lived, where he ate, everything. That was daily schedule. He hopes his threat will persuade Garcia to play it safe. Once you kill law enforcement, the U.S. side of the border, our hell's gonna break loose. So the only way I was gonna take him out too is if he got in my way. After Bart's threat, the Laredo police park a cruiser at Garcia's house 24-7. Barretta's threat doesn't stop the detective. Just the opposite. Finding the elusive Bart Simpson just got personal. Well, that's when it kind of hits home. And I get, well, I guess this is for real. I did not take it as a threat of myself. I did not take it as, as, as something that I should be scared of, honestly. I took it more like, how dare he? How, how dare he calls me on my phone and tells me this? It just made me go look for him even harder. Rosalie Oretta may have picked the wrong Texas lawman to tangle with. The war between two of Mexico's powerful drug cartels is spilling over onto American streets. The bodies are piling up on both sides of the border. One, two. Moises Garcia is a successful businessman with a family in Laredo. He's near the front lines, but he thinks he's under the radar. He's wrong. His business is selling drugs. Cartel kingpin Miguel Trevino has decided Moises has got to go. Why? Moises has been selling drugs supplied by the Sinaloa cartel. That makes him a traitor. He's working with the Sinaloans, but his homies are allied to the Gulf cartel. Bad move. Moises Garcia was, uh, was alleged to be um, an operative for the Sinaloa cartel, um, whereas some hits were for personal reasons. That was, uh, that seemed to be directly because of business. In Mikhail Trevino's campaign to wipe out any Sinaloan troops in Laredo, Moises Garcia is just one of a long list of foot soldiers who have to die. Trevino sicks his Sicarios on him. It's a job. Just like you got a family, you got to feed, I got one too. And so does Moises Garcia. It'll be the last thing he ever does. It's Thursday, the 8th of December, 2005. Moises Garcia and his wife and son are out for an early dinner. It's a friendly venue for a last meal. Things have been breaking Garcia's way for a while. But all good things come to an end. The order to kill Moises Garcia came directly from Miguel Trevino with his group of sicarios, that being Jesse Gonzalez, Cardona, and Rosalio Reta. They wouldn't do the killing unless it was ordered by, directly by him. Even a run-of-the-mill pop like Moises Garcia is meticulously planned. The targets were assigned. Sometimes they would come in with a package with their name or photograph. I look it up. I find where he lives, what he drives, where he works, family, everything for a couple of days until they tell me to kill him. That's what he enjoyed, the surveillance and the tracking down. He, he enjoyed the hunt. You would follow them around Monday through Friday. You know, Monday he picks up his daughter at 3.30. You know, always has lunch at such and such place. You know, uh, his home typically by this time might stop off at this bar. So they had notes and when the order came down, they would refer to their to their book and see, okay, well, it's Wednesday, he should be here right about now. The, the tactics they were using was very impressive. They knew where he lived, and he said they set up surveillance at his house, it was an apartment. But they were never able to uh, catch him when he left. The problem with tracking down a drug dealer like Moises 
is he just doesn't keep regular hours. Luckily for Retter and crew, he does drive a distinctive car. Look, 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 right there, right there. They were driving around, they spotted his vehicle. He was driving a white Lexus at the time. They located him at a uh, restaurant where he was having lunch with his, with his wife and one of his kids. Moises Garcia is a dead man Nashi. You can see it, too, on, on the video. You see this Bronco just, you know, circling the place two, three, four times, waiting for Moises Garcia to leave. The boys don't care that Moises is with his son and pregnant wife. Having a kid there just makes it easier. He's less likely to return fire. During the meal, Moises gets a phone call. Security calls. Lunch is over. Tip off a setup. We'll probably never know. Moises doesn't tell his wife why, just says, hey, it's time to go. But the predators have had all the time they need. They've picked a spot and a strategy. Boom, boom, boom. Training. It pays off when you're under pressure. He's ready for this man. He's ready for this shit. When he comes out and they see the vehicle backing and start heading towards the exit, they block him. Retek exits the vehicle and approaches the driver's side. His wife was in the passenger seat. One of his young children were in the back seat. Retek just starts boom, 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 just firing away. Retek's 9mm holds 10 slugs. He empties it. Awesome is what Rosalio Retta calls it, an awesome hit. He struck multiple times in the head and on the left side of, the, of, of his body. I don't feel anything about it. I don't feel there's nothing wrong, even though I know it's, it's not what a normal person would do. Moises dies instantly, but he's not the only one Retta shoots. Some of the rounds go completely through him and strikes the, the passenger, which was uh, the wife. Two bullets hit Moises' wife. Miraculously, she and her unborn daughter are not badly hurt. Their son in the back seat is OK, physically, anyhow. More than anything, it was more just a sheer panic and, and uh, brutality of it, of seeing it happen right before your eyes, right next to you. She's deeply traumatized, but Moises' wife can describe the kid who shot her and killed her husband. She described the shooter and how it happened and how the shooter just got down, didn't say anything, just pulled out, you know, a gun and uh, started shooting away. But more than anything, it was her physical description of the shooter, the young man with, with a lunar, which is a mole. In those days before he got his tattoos, that mole was the one thing that made Retta memorable. It will be the vital clue that gives a face to Moises Garcia's killer. Moises Garcia, a Laredo, Texas drug dealer, has met his fate in the parking lot of a tortilla stand. For Rosalio Retta and his fellow teenage Sicarios, killing Garcia is just an afternoon's work. They flee the, the area, travel approximately six or seven blocks from there calls some Sicario friends to come and pick him up and takes him to a safe house. The boys don't think Moises was important. They were wrong about that. And killing him in front of his family was a big mistake. Moises' wife got a good look. The kid with the gun had a mole on his face. Retta crosses the river to lay low in Mexico for a bit. Cardona and Gonzalez stay in Laredo, but they move to a new safe house in a nice neighborhood. Bad move. After the Moises hit, 
it doesn't take Detective Robert Garcia long to ID the teenage assassins. Even worse for the Sicarios, one of their drug gang pals is a mole. He steers them to rent the house Garcia's pre-wired for video and sound. The detective's new Sicario channel is a lawman's dream. That's not a normal day-to-day -day conversation that they have. It's not, let's go to the movies or let's go to the mall. It's just talking about, let's go kill this person. <laughs> it's totally different. By April 2006, only four months after Moises was killed, the cops have everything they need on tape. The safe house crew hears a knock, a big knock. Rent is not there. He's in Mexico. But it's all over for his childhood pal, Gabriel Cardona. Gabriel Cardona is so impressed with the task force videos, he decides a trial is way too risky. And getting out of prison would likely lead to something really unpleasant. Trevano and the Zetas will be pissed off when they learn how much Cardona gave up when he confessed. A Texas prison is the safest place he can be. The third member of the assassin's cell, Jesse Gonzalez, gets away and also hightails it to Mexico. Another bad plan. He's arrested by Mexican police and is promptly murdered in jail by the Zetas. So what about Rosalio Reta? He stays in Mexico to avoid the heat, and the cartel has plenty of work for him anyhow. His body count is going up, notch by notch. But with Jesse dead and Gabriel behind bars, 16-year-old Rosalio finally loses it. He goes rogue. He was causing problems for his uh, superiors, who had to answer for him and uh, eventually got tired. He was too ruthless for them at the time. What does it take to be too ruthless for the Zetas, the guys who put the carne in carnage? Well, there is that night in Monterey, Mexico. What happens in Monterey is that him and another group of individuals go to a nightclub called El Punto to kill a Mexican mafia member. And they toss four hand grenades into the nightclub and spray the people in there with an automatic fire, AK-47. I went in, and instead of just killing one, I killed four. They were affiliated with the same person. So I took them all out and threw some grenades in there. He injured 25 people. Despite the impressive body count, it seems Retta doesn't get who he's after. And his paymaster, Trevino, told him not to do the hit at all. They say I didn't kill the right person at the, at the bar. Well, I'm not known for missing my targets. He does miss the point, however. Even if you've got grenades, you don't disobey the boss of the Zetas. So now Miguel Trevino is seriously annoyed. And Trevino doesn't have a line between irritated and homicidal. Retta's got some splaining to do. But mostly, Retta is a loose cannon. The Zetas, they don't like those. The tables kind of switched, and they actually wanted to kill him. That's the shame of, of it all here, too, is, you know, these kids, they're as disposable as a razor blade to these cartels, you know? Once your use is done, you're done. So here's the story of what happens next. It's the one Retta tells anyhow. Two Sicarios stuff him in the trunk of a car. They're headed to the desert. Retta knows this drill. Things are looking very bad. Retta's camp Zeta skills come back. He kills his captors and run for it. But the Mexican cops bring him down. He ends up in a Mexican jail. He knows the Zetas will kill him if he doesn't get out fast. Jesse Gonzalez only lasted a few days. If I would have stayed over there, eventually they were going to kill me. But that's, that's one of the things that comes with it. You want to be part of a certain group. Once you get caught, you're going to be locked up or you're going to be dead. So it didn't really matter. Rhett has got one hope. There is one person he knows who would like to see him alive and who could keep him out of the stew pot. You guessed it, Detective Robert Garcia. Bart. He's happy to hear from Bart. And just like that, he's out of Mexico and in a Texas jail. He comes across the border the day after he turns 17. Well, I liked what I did. I killed my first one, and I liked it. 
I felt like Superman. Okay. Why? Because I killed someone. I'm sitting in front of this 17-year-old kid, and he's telling me all he's done, and he's telling me how he's doing it, and the way he feels. And the only thing I can think of that I got my own 17-year-old kid at home, and I'm upset at him if we don't cut the grass. And you know, it's 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 hard to describe, you know, what I'm thinking. That is like, what makes him think this way? How, what makes what makes him him turn turn out to be this way? They put me as a monster. That I killed innocent people that kill everybody just because I, I can, just because I'm able to do it. That's not true. I don't kill no innocent people. If you don't know anything, you ain't got no reason to fear anything. In the end, we're at the cops to 30 murders in Mexico, more or less. It was only a number, because I'm not really sure. He won't confess to killing anyone in the US. But that print he left in the No Way Flores getaway car sinks him. Convicted in the Flores case, Berta finally admits to killing Moises Garcia. Combined sentence, 70 years. That's four times the 17 years he spent on the outside. Moises Garcia, his son and his daughter, born a few weeks after Moises died, they got life without a dad. Not that ever show, showed any kind of remorse towards the, the, the murders that he committed or the victims he left. To compare him to other criminals, you can't, uh, his thinking is totally different. He's a psycho, he's scary. He's a scary person. I mean, he's a, he's a, even though he's a young kid, he's just one of those ones that, that you get to fear when you sit in there and talking to him. And what about Miguel Trevino? He and the Zetas break away from the Gulf Cartel in 2009 and go to war against their former compadres. As of 2011, Trevino is still one of the most wanted men in North America. When I started, I know what, what I got myself into. I know right from wrong. And uh, I knew that eventually a day I was going to end up being in prison or getting killed. It's only one way in and one way out. How do you feel about your victims and their families? Too bad for them. No sense of remorse or... No. And that war over who gets the money that cascades south from American drug users? Well, that's still going on. What's happening now? makes Retta and Cardona look warm and fuzzy. And that, my friends, takes some doing.